Sorry, go ahead and start. Yes. So it's a pleasure to introduce Peter Diane for the, this distinguished lecture. So Peter was an undergrad at Cambridge where he studied mathematics and was a, a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he then was at the Salk Institute and the University of Toronto as a postdoc. Um, he was a professor at MIT, and uh, he was one of the co-founders of the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit, where he was a director for uh, maybe about 15 years. Um, and Gatsby, as many people know, this is one of the best uh, theoretical neuroscience units and machine learning uni uh, units in the world. And uh, Peter is really just a leading researcher in uh, decision-making processes in the brain, brain, and he's also made numerous uh, fundamental contributions to AI, uh, including work on the successor representation, an idea which many people uh, are revisiting now. Uh, Peter's had uh, numerous awards, inclu including the Remo Hart Prize for contributions to the theoretical foundations of human cognition. Uh, for, uh, on a personal note, I just want to mention that I'm deeply indebted to Peter because uh, he was my advisor at the Gatsby unit, and those of us who have interacted with Peter are, you know, we're deeply aware of his clarity of thinking and his just broad interest in so many areas. So uh, I'm just very grateful the ways in which he's influenced my own thinking. And going forward in my new role with the Kemp you know, Institute, you know, I'm really hoping I can be uh, as successful as, uh, as Peter was and learn from his mentorship. So Peter, give Peter a welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Let me just share my screen. And then, um, yeah. So the first thing I would say, thank you so much indeed for the invitation. And also thanks, Sean, for that uh, wonderful introduction. So, you know, one of the, uh, in some sense, one of the best things for a, any academic is when their students supersede them. Uh, it's hard for us to take, but certainly in the case of Sean, I think I was superseded probably just within about a year and a half of the time he came to Gansby. So it was fantastic having a Sean as a graduate student, I really um, enjoyed uh, the, the occasional interaction we've had since, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing this uh, wonderful initiative that uh, you're building in, in Harvard. So the work I'm going to talk about today is called the Peril, Prudence and Planning as Risk, Avoidance and Worry. And I really want to acknowledge uh, Chris Gagney, who's a postdoc of mine at, uh, in Tübingen, who's really done um, uh, by far the lion's share of, of, of the work. So the plan for the talk is, I want to talk a bit about risk aversion, and I'm going to talk about it in, a, in the sort of the context of computational uh, psychiatry, and I'll just set that out in, in just a minute. I'm going to talk about how we use a particular sort of a risk measure, we're called a CVAR, or conditional value at risk, in the context of sequential problems. So CVAR is something that comes from the financial industry, but I think you'd argue that it really is ideal for thinking about risk and, and actually in the context of things like anxiety and psychiatric disorders. I'll talk about a couple of different ways of formulating CVAR in sequential problems. It's not quite as simple as you, as you might think from the work on things like say prospect theory that you may be familiar with. Um, and so then with that, we'll talk a bit about risk averse online behavior. So how is it you should pay if you want to be risk averse? And we'll see some very simple sort of uh, uh, mock-up uh, decision problems where risk aversion becomes important. And then we'll talk a bit about risk averse offline planning. So if you're somebody who is risk averse, then maybe you can take the advantage of time when you're not actually um, engaged in doing something in the world to plan what you would do in a context. We think this is quite important for, for instance, different aspects of say the defensive hierarchy as you're, as you're planning uh, 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 what to do if, if uh, predators or something nasty comes up in, in, in your environment. And that leads us to think about replay processes, something very familiar from the hippocampus uh, of rodents, but also in humans too, and also rumination or worry. So, so uh, anxiety uh, leads to those and also depression too. Okay, so the context of this is uh, computational psychiatry, something which uh, as you have a, a fantastic group uh, with uh, Sam Gershman and others in, uh, in Harvard working on in, in these uh, and, and other areas too. So um, here, this is what we're trying to do is to use our understanding largely in this instance of decision-making, the way that decision-making should go to understand how it can break down in various different ways. And so you know, there are various ways that one can split the pie of computational psychiatry. And so the context of risk, I think it's convenient to do it in a, I like to sort of split it up into, into three different contexts. One is the idea that you, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the flesh might be willing, so you have the capacity to do things, but the things you're trying to do are 
are for some in some way are, are dysfunctional compared to normal um, populations. So the context of risk, maybe you you have a dramatic overvaluation. Let me get my laser pointer. You have a dramatic overvaluation of negative outcomes, for instance, which means that then when you do planning or when you when you decide what to do, then you're going to do things which which are going to look abnormal with respect to the healthy population. So we call that the wrong problem. So you're correctly solving an incorrect problem. On the other hand, um, it might be that you're the, 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 the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you're trying to solve the correct problem, but maybe the way the means that you have, the cognitive or the, the computational means you have to solve that problem is inadequate to uh, get all the way. So for instance, in the context of risk, maybe you have to think forward an awful lot to work out exactly how you can navigate between uh, uh, costs and benefits. And if you can't do that navigation, then you'll look risk averse in the behavior that you have. Um, but of course, you could have the, the flesh could be weak and the spirit could be weak too. That's what we call Brexit, sadly. Um, but I think the most interesting one also is the case where, they, where you're trying to solve the correct problem with the correct means, but the environment that you've adapted for is perhaps an environment that doesn't afford appropriate opportunities. Or for instance, maybe you adapt to an environment in which there really are an awful lot of different sorts of risks. And so therefore it becomes adaptive, for instance, not to explore it because the, the dangers are too immense. So then if the environment changes, so it goes from this uh, desert to this rich, uh, lush rainforest, then you, uh, then you're, but you're still stuck with your old way of thinking about the, about the environment. Then maybe you're not going to use that to try and explore and, and, and then discover that in fact the environment has changed. So in the context of risk, we're going to, we can think about each of these different pieces will lead to interesting different problems and we'll come back to those a little bit um, at the end. Okay, so decision making and risk. So, so a lot of, as I mentioned, computational psychiatry has to do with decision making. So, risk is a very critical aspect of decision making. So, you know, everything from car crashes to you know global pandemics and and worse. Um, and it always involves decision making with respect to uh, uncertain outcomes, so probabilistic outcomes. And of course, there are maybe things like second order probabilistic outcomes, like ambiguity, for instance, could be very influential in those cases too. Um, and of course, we have whole industries de designed around it, so finance and insurance markets. This is Lloyd's of London, for those of you who who, uh, who recognise this. And that's where we're going to derive some, we'll you extract some of our computational thinking from those areas. Um, and um, in particular, it likely plays a very crucial role in various aspects of psychopathology. So, th so conditions like anxiety and mania are conditions where different aspects of risk become really important for the way that people um, behave and the way that they think. And indeed, there's this notion of these sort of rumination where you people get stuck in thinking about the, the, about the dangerous things that might happen. There are these sort of chains of what ifs. You know, what if you know, somebody, for instance, had got run over? You know, what if there might my breakfast has been warmer, I've eaten it more slowly. What if I talk to my neighbor as I walk down the stairs? So those sorts of, uh, of ways of trying to plan to avoid risks in a, in a, in a very open-ended world become really important and really devastating because you can never essentially terminate this whole process of rumination. So in, in, in psychology, uh, uh, the sort of paradigms that people have used to, to, to study risk, you know, many you know, decades of work looking at this, and a lot of paradigms have this sort of very, this um, this sort of structure. So here you might offer subjects a choice between a safe option, so you choose the to, to go play, press click left and get a small amount of uh, money, so you win small but for sure. Or if you click, um, if you choose the other option, you're taking a risk. Then in that case, you have a chance of winning a large amount of money or winning nothing. And then in this, just this one example I just uh, took from the, from the internet, so here, the color of the circle tells you what the probability is of getting the reward on this risky choice. So here it was just 10%, but it could be up to 90%. And you can titrate how people value these different sorts of risks. And so there are things like cumulative prospect theory from, um, uh, from uh, Kahneman and Tversky, which have you know, very beautifully looked at the way that we evaluate these sort of single shot risks. There's a lovely paper from Tom Griffiths recently doing a huge study in, in science, doing a huge study amongst a uh, large number of people talking about exactly with enough uh, subjects that we could really get a, 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 like a clear view of what the prospect theoretic um, choice was. But the most interesting problems for, for decision making, indeed the ones that Sean works on, uh, us too, are on sequential cases. That's where you have to make a whole sequence of decisions um, in order to, um, you know, for instance, get a reward or, um, or, or you know, before you find out what the outcome's going to be. So here's a very simple example. So just a very simple maze where you maybe start here. You know, there's a goal here where you get a certain amount of reward. 
but there's a danger, there's a lava pit, as, a, as Chris likes to call them, which has, has a big negative uh, outcome, which is, which is risky. And the system is risky, and the process is risky because there's some probability that, there's, that the, the action you take is not successful. So um, the sort of thing you might see is if you're risk neutral, maybe we set it up such that the optimum path to take to avoid taking too many steps to the goal, and so losing too much money uh, or too much reward with discounting, uh, takes you very close to this uh, lava pit. As you, come, as you become more risk averse, maybe what should happen is you take you plot a larger path around this lava pit so you don't risk with this stochastic action error uh, running, into the, uh, running into the lava pit and running into problems. And if you are even more risk averse, then maybe what you do is you really plan just the complete outskirts of this domain in order to get to the, to the goal to try and avoid as much as possible the, the chance that you might fall into this lava pit. So what we'd like to do is to understand how people might plan in these environments and then you know, and plan these paths around the outcome, uh, which are of, uh, of these uh, different um, you know, at these different risk levels in some way. So what sort of measures might we use? Well, of course, given a set of random outcomes, so here, this is a, uh, these are a set of uh, rewards, this is a distribution of the possible rewards you could get, then the one natural thing to do would just be to have the, 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 the mean utility or some expected non-linear utility, so like a, like a saturating or a convex or a concave utility function, which have properties with respect to, to risk. That's one way, that's, that's certainly a, a coherent way of thinking about risk. Um, but uh, another way that is, uh, people often used, started, started using um, you know, many years ago in the finance industry was some notion of a, like a Markowitz um, a, a risk measure, where we subtract out something times the variance. So we have things about the mean of this distribution minus some proportion of the variance. And so if the variance is big, that means that you're penalizing those options which have large variance. But of course, the trouble with that is that you're equally penalizing both positive and negative risk because you know, the, rare, you, you know, the variance looks like you know, has this, this nasty uh, component. And furthermore, it doesn't satisfy some properties which have been worked out in the finance industry that you'd like good quality risk measures to have. There's a notion of coherence in risk measures. There's a very important paper by Arntzner in the, in the late 90s. And so, the, for instance, you want things like diversification, to, which should lead to lower, lower risk. And this uh, mean and variance uh, measure doesn't, uh, doesn't satisfy that property. And furthermore, it doesn't capture the flavor of what we think that people, for instance, in the psychiatric populations might be worried about, which is the, nasty, the really nasty things that might happen. So when you're, thinking about, um, when you're thinking about risk for us, it's natural to think about worst case outcomes, and that's natural in medicine, in finance, engineering, many different, um, many different contexts, and also maybe even surviving predation too. And so what that invites us to think about is the lower tail of the distribution of outcomes. So here's, you know, again, here's this distribution. Somehow we'd like to say we, what we really care about is what life is like in this lower tail, and if we can understand how to control the, 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 the nature of that lower tail, then in that case, maybe we can, um, we can have a good, um, good way of ameliorating or mitigating the problems in our environment. So um, the one risk measure, coherent risk measure, which is really, which focuses exactly on this lower tail, which is why we are going to then use it for the rest of this talk, is called the conditional value of risk. So here again is another you know, slightly simpler distribution. Here are the outcomes we have, here are the probabilities. So the average of these, these, these outcomes is just slightly less than zero just by, by construction. So there's like the value at risk, so v VAR, with a certain risk level alpha is just the lower alpha tail of that, that distribution where that ends up in the reward axis. So here you say you work out where the, in this case, the 30% quantile of this distribution is. And that number is the, called the value at risk. The trouble is the value at risk itself is also not a coherent risk measure. It doesn't have this diversification property that I mentioned. Um, but the mean of all those outcomes which live underneath the there, so underneath this, in this 30% quantile, that is a coherent risk measure. Oops, I'm just drawing my screen, thank you. Um, is a coherent risk measure. And that uh, uh, risk measure is something then we, that we can then use because it satisfies these, these nice properties. And as I say, there's this paper by Artsner and then also by, um, by uh, uh, Rockefeller on Eurosev, but they've looked at this, um, done quite a bit of work on this CVAR measure, this conditional value of risk measure. And so as you can imagine, if alpha is one, that means you're taking the whole distribution. If alpha is 0.3, we have this 30% distribution. And as alpha goes towards zero, you just look at the minimum, the worst possible thing that can happen in this distribution. <laughs> 
So there are two ways, two convenient ways to think about the uh, C-bar. So here I've shown you this is the risk preference where as you, uh, so here, alpha equals one, it's just the regular average value because you're taking the entire distribution, the, quantum, you know, the, the average value of everything. And so in that case, um, you're seeing this, um, this whole distribution here. But then as alpha goes, gets smaller and smaller, we're taking a smaller and smaller tail. And this uh, black dashed line is telling what is the average value in that tail. And the colors here show you which bit of this distribution we're actually averaging together. So the dark colors are the bit that are averaged to make this um, to make the uh, to make the mean in this um, in this instance. So formally, the C bar at alpha is the expected value of those of those outcomes which live underneath this underneath the, the value at risk. So underneath the the value which is this um, which is where the where it turns from from dark blue into into light blue. And there's a there's an equivalent value if you have a discrete distribution um, which I won't uh, I won't describe. So this is one view where we average like that. But there's another view that you can think about, which comes, um, which uh, uh, where, where we think about sort of weighting the probability dis the, the the distribution of outcomes that you can uh, that that uh, can arise. So let me try and move this away. So here we have all the different outcomes of these different probabilities. And one way of thinking about what we're going to do when we do this process of working out this um, this lower quantile is we are essentially multiplying these outcomes, these probabilities by, by zero, because then they don't contribute to the value at risk, conditional value at risk. And then these other ones, we have these weighted measures um, where the weights then essentially overweight these components of the distribution, and they overweight them because they're in this lower tail that we care about. And so um, it turns out that, the, that there's a weighting function, this psi function here, and you can write down a, a formula for this psi function where you say, I'm going to choose the essentially the, 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 a set of psi's which have to satisfy some property. So the, 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 every psi, I have to, in the end, I have a sort of total amount of, of distortion to my risk measure that I'm allowed. And so that's, and that's governed by the alpha parameter um, that the, the, the risk measure is, 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 is associated with. And you say that I need to make sure I have a new distribution which adds up to one, and the maximum distortion I can have is one over alpha. So if the alpha is 0 0.3, then the maximum distortion I can have is one over 0 0.3, so it's, you know, it's uh, three and a third. And then I, I can multiply the, the, the probabilities by three and a third until I add up all my distributions up to one. And they're the only outcomes which then get any probability in working out the C-bar. So these are two equivalent, almost dual views of this C-bar. And it turns out that this one is very convenient for thinking about how to make decisions in a sequential decision-making problem. Okay, so just to sum up uh, briefly on C-bar. So C-bar has a good property. It's this, it has a, it's a coherent risk measure, which means it satisfies these nice properties as a distortion risk measure um, by distorting those probabilities. It emphasizes the lower tail. That's just appropriate for these really nasty outcomes that can happen. If alpha is equal to one, that's just the regular mean. So then, then we're just doing completely regular uh, choices and regular decision making with alpha equal to one. As alpha tends to zero, we get the absolute worst case. It's just always the minimum because the maximum distortion is essentially infinity. So therefore, of course, you're going to just focus on the, the absolute uh, nastiest case that can possibly happen. And we have this nice equivalence where we have these distorted or um, distorted probabilities favoring the bad outcomes that can happen. Okay, so that was the sort of discrete case of, of the, the single choice case of CBAR. What happens when we think about sequential decision making? And that's where it gets essentially more interesting for us. So here's a very, very simple sequential decision making problem where we have a start state and there are two outcomes, a bad outcome and a good outcome. So the bad one has 10% probability, the good one has 90% probability. And what makes it bad is that the rewards you get at these, um, at the bad outcome, all of them, they come from this distribution but they're all less than zero. Whereas the good outcome, they come from the similar distribution, but just shifted up. So these ones are all greater than zero. So if you just start at the, the start state, so here there's no choice to be made. It's just a, a state state, like a Markov evaluation problem. You start at the start state. You think, okay, well, here's the, the net distribution of outcomes that I would get um, from, this, um, from, this, uh, from this start state if this is the way that I get outcomes as a whole, you know, by 10% of this, and 90% of that. So that's why this is down weighted, because you're only 10% likely to go down into this branch here. But let's think about what this looks like from the perspective then of CBAR. Right? So PC, so the so one version of CBAR says we look at this distribution at the beginning. And if we set our alpha to be 10%, so that's the 10% quantile, 
That means what we should do is march along this distribution until we get to a, a weight of 10%. That's the VAR, so that's the value at risk. And then the CVAR is just the average value in this, in this uh, group. So here's actually shown by this uh, dashed line here. But think about evaluating that in sequence. So if you're this start state, then when we have these distorted probabilities, the distortion says that the, the, um, the, the, all the distortion weight says it should go on this, um, this nasty outcome, the 10% the, 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 the outcome. And none of the, and so therefore the weighting for the good outcome is zero because we're interested in maximizing the, you know, we're interested in these, the really nasty tail of this distribution. And we chose alpha just appropriately to, to, to make this point. So that means that now the weighting of, of, the, of the good outcomes is zero, just as you might imagine. So these all get into this uh, blue, into this uh, light blue color, because they're not going to contribute to our, piece, our C bar at this uh, start state. But now think about the C bar at the, at the, at the lower state. So now we've got to this state, but if you wanted to compute the, the average value of this, of the, the C bar that you need to compute from this starting distribution, it means that now you're going to have to use every single possible outcome in the distribution you've got to at the bad state. So you might think well, what you should do at this bad state is now, well, now I should apply my, my um, risk measure again, my C bar measure again, and focus on the lower tail of this distribution. But that's wrong. If you think from the perspective of the start state, then you want to compute, you, want, you now have to essentially adjust this value of alpha to accommodate the fact that you've already essentially something nasty has already happened. So we've overweighted the probability of something nasty happening. If it does happen, then in that case, now we have to rebalance and say, well, now all these outcomes contribute to their full strength to the average value, the C bar that we have at the beginning. And so then we need to reweight the alpha and go from being an alpha of 0.1 actually to an alpha of one. Turns out you have to multiply the alpha by the same factor that you multiply the, the probability by. So here we multiply this by 10. We have to multiply this one by the alpha by 10 as well when we look at this C bar. So we're going to call this um, value the pre-committed C bar. So it's a sort of time inconsistency or, uh, that's built into the way that this C bar works. And that's actually will be familiar to many of you who've thought about how to do um, something like risk sensitivity in, in, in a sequential problem. Because as time goes by, sometimes good things happen, sometimes bad things happen. And when bad things happen, you've already consumed some of the nasty outcomes. And so that means that now you can afford to be, for instance, a bit more risk seeking in the future because you know, nasty things will, will have already happened. So here we're privileging a start state. And we're defining our risk relative to that start state. And that means that we're going to have to rebalance the way we think about risk um, in, in the light of that. Uh, in, in the light of that. So formally, what we're doing in, in PC bar, Oh, this pre-committed C-bar, as I said, we're privileging a start state like a home or, an, or a nest we'll think about. And the C-bar then is applied to this whole random variable, which is the, uh, the, the sum of total returns we can get or uh, discounted total returns we can get from this start state. Um, and that starts at, that gets a privilege. Um, and so um, that means that as we, as we take steps in this world, we have to change our value, our risk, our risk preference, um, where roughly speaking, if we're unlucky, then alpha should increase, just like we were on that bad state. And if we're lucky, then alpha should decrease, we should become more risk, uh, risk averse. So there's a sort of justified gambler's fallacy in this instance, where you know, if you say, well, something bad's happened, which means that only good things are going to happen in the future. And in some sense, for the way that you evaluate risk, that's exactly true. And the way that happens is by manipulating the value of alpha, this risk preference that, that you have. And in this instance, alpha is zero and one are special. So alpha equals one, you never reweight one because you're already at the average value. And if you're at alpha equals zero, so you're just looking at the worst possible outcome. And again, you're always thinking about the worst possible outcome all the way through. So that never changes uh, either. So how, we, how can we do this? There's this nice paper by Chow et al, where either we can treat it because of this time and consistency problem, we can either treat this like a history dependent evaluation where you have to think about where I, where you, how you've gotten to a place in the tree, or you can have this re-weighting process with alpha. So we can add the alpha dimension as an implicit or an internal latent state that, um, a variable dimension. And then as we make transitions in the world, where lucky and unlucky transitions, we have tied transitions in alpha, which then do this re-weighting of risk as I just talked about. So formally, we have a Bellman-like a Bellman equation. This is the, um, the evaluation case where now when you reweight the probabilities, that's this psi terms as I mentioned, where we 
up weight nasty things that can happen so that's why we're minimizing this outcome we're finding the size in this in this pool of possible size where we have the maximum possible distortion and when we do that we reweight the probabilities and at the same time we reweight the alpha so if you become you know you reweight the probability to favor something nasty and at the same time when that when you do that you also reweight the alpha to make you more risk, um, allow you to be more risk seeking in the future. And then, if you make choices, then you can um, then you can use the same form which I won't go through. Okay, so how does this look like in a simple random walk? So here's a here's a here's an extremely simple one dimensional random walk where you have um, uh, uh, where there, there's a lava pit here, there's a start state here, and there are two um, rewards. There's a reward worth two right next to the lava pit, and there's a reward worth one which is uh, on the other side. And you have your action probabilities, which I think here are 10% um, chance of, of, of going the wrong way. So you ask to go left, right, or stay, and you stay with that probability, and then you have 5% um, probability of going in the other direct, one of the other two directions. So that's what it makes life risky. And you can't guarantee that if you go for this big, this uh, larger reward, you can't guarantee that you will then won't uh, run into this, um, into this lava pit where everything stops. So, from the perspective of the start state, if we have a, uh, if we just do, um, uh, we choose each action uniformly at random, so a third probability of each of them. Here's the distribution of returns that you would get from that, um, from that case starting at this, starting at this location. And what we'd like to understand is how this looks like from the, from a C-bar perspective. Okay, so with this uniform policy, um, if your alpha is one, you're just, you're just looking at the average value, the total average value. What I'm showing you here is the is the the values shown in this um, in this uh, plot for being at each of these states, and then you can see that because of the chance that uh, with this average value, in fact, even you go your third probability, you choose to go left here. That's why these values these states aren't worth so much. They're red and um, they're, they're, they're in the nasty zone. Um, now, if you choose alpha equals zero, which means that now you're um, you're only looking at the minimum. What you see is that um, now uh, all these states suddenly become red, which means that because you're always thinking about the worst possible outcome, which means that if you start here, the worst outcome is you go left and then left and left and left. You keep on running it left until you get to the lava pit where catastrophe happens. What I'm showing you here in these gray arrows, so the white, the, in the white boxes are what you program your policy to be. So that's the third and third in each of these directions. And the gray arrows show you essentially by their width, show you what these, this distorted risk measure, this distorted probability ends up doing for you. So here, the probabilities are exactly what you might imagine. They're all the probabilities of moving the directions you could see. Here, these distorted probabilities all move you completely left, and then you get into the lava pit, and then catastrophe happens. If you look at a different um, uh, risk um, value, now what we can look at is for these different risk values of, um, in this case, uh, no, 0 0.05, you now see that these, you have a bunch of different values in these locations. And now these, as I mentioned, because you have to revalue the risk, if something, um, if something not, uh, unlucky happens, for instance, you're moving left, it means you can become a bit more risk seeking, which means you move up to a higher value of alpha. So here, um, what I'm showing you is all these different values of um, states, so these green, these green to red, and then all the, all the uh, changes in the risk preference that happen as, you, as, a as a function of how lucky or unlucky you are. And then these weightings terms show you, uh, you know, when you at this value of alpha, this value of risk, um, risk aversion, how likely you are, think you are to move left to express that risk aversion versus to move right. And so we think that there are people are going to be thinking about these, these you know, who are worried about risk, are already thinking about, well, I'm overweighting the chance of moving in the unfortunate direction. Um, and that's why we're going to have these, these reweightings you see here. Um, uh, if we look at the optimal policy, so here this was just uh, just choosing according to the um, you know, this random walk. Here now, what these boxes show you is now with the optimal policy are these different values of alpha. So now you can see that the optimal policy, if you're risk neutral, is at the start state to go left, and then you just carry on going left, and you then try and stay at this location. But if you are, you know, if you're near to the to the to the um, other uh, other reward, you stay there because of temporal discounting. At alpha equals zero. Because the, you're always only worried about the worst thing that can happen, it actually doesn't matter what you do. There's no way you can stave off catastrophe in this um, if your alpha equals zero. Therefore, there's a sort of learned helplessness in that instance where no matter what you do, it doesn't have an impact on the on the on the outcome. And then, uh, 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 and then in the intermediate value. So here, remember, PC bar. We have to start. You know, we have to privilege a start state. 
So here we have privilege of start state with a starting risk preference, 0.3. So you can see here all the values of what you do. And in particular, what we, we designed the problem, such as this start state, with this risk preference, you actually move right to go to the safe reward rather than moving left to go to the unsafe reward because of the structure of the, that's what you try to do, to the structure of the, um, of, the, of the problem. So you can see that the policy changes because of your risk preference until you get to this maximal risk preference where, there's, where, where doom is uh, inevitable and there's nothing you can do. Um, here's another little problem. You can see these uh, where we have something, uh, we made it a little bit more dramatic on two dimensional problem, where now we make it a bit like a cliff. So now we have these lava pits which are on a, in a line and you can ask um, again, you're trying to get from a start state here, you know, but there's a big reward at the end uh, here, a bit like the problem I showed you earlier on. So if you're risk neutral, what you do is you happily start here, you just go straight along, you're dicing with death or dicing with the lava pit and then until you get to the, to, the, to the final value and get the reward. And then as you make yourself more risk averse, as what you might imagine now from every state is that you now um, are trying to avoid the, the lava pits. You have to go further out um, to avoid, you take extra steps in the world to avoid this chance of getting to this uh, nasty outcome. And then here, for alpha is 0.05, you can see that you're, you know, you're, you're, the, the values have now changed such that, they, that even though at this location, what you program is to go upwards, your risk um, aversion is such that you, because the probability of, of um, going downwards instead is such that these values, the values of these states is now very low. So even though you can actually, you, know, you have the same chance of actually avoiding the lava pit, in your mind, it gets overblown because of the risk preference. And so therefore these states become very negative. Um, okay, so back to PC bar. As I argued, what we were doing here is we had to revalue this, this alpha term because we were interested at the start state in the full distribution of the, of the, the full um, C bar distribution. However, there's another way, another time consistent way of doing things where what you do is you just say, I'm just simply going to use this alpha preference no matter where I am in the tree. So at every single point, I'm always going to think about the, um, the lower 10% of the distribution of the outcomes. And that's what, I'm going to, uh, that's what I'm going to apply. And when you do that, that means that when you get to this location here, you only think about the bottom 10% of that distribution. So now I show them in red which means that from the, the perspective of the start state, um, it means that the distribution you're thinking about are these very negative uh, ones here. These just these, this is this, like this, a much more risk averse um, component of the distribution of that location. So when you think about that, um, you can't write down nearly such a nice form of what you're trying to, of what you're trying to achieve because you have this essentially this recursive application of this CVAR process with a fixed value of alpha at every single state. But on the other hand, you don't have to have this second dimension. You don't have to induce this extra alpha dimension and worry about how alpha changes as you go. So you can commit to a single value of alpha bar that you do forever. And so therefore, we, we, can, we can work in a much simpler domain with this NC bar. So we call this nested C bar because, of course, it has this nesting property that you can see in terms of these values. And it means we're applying the same value of alpha throughout this sort of process. So this sort of nested evaluation. And as you might imagine, as you could see in that tree case, it gets ever more conservative because you keep on choosing the bottom bit of the distributions as you go through and you're overweighting the negative things that, uh, that can happen. So you get this sort of very uh, big conservativity. And you have these similar Bellman equations where, uh, except that now we don't need to, re to have an explicit dimension of alpha because we're not re-weighting alpha as we go. We just stick with a, with a given value of alpha at all time. And we have the same evaluation and optimization equations, Bellman equations to work out what to do. Um, okay, so how about this random walk? So this was the PC bar that I showed you before for the uniform policy. What does the NC bar look like? Well, again, if alpha equals one, it doesn't matter. There's no revaluation going on, so they're the same. If alpha equals zero, it doesn't matter because there's no revaluation going on. They're just the same. So you have the same learned helplessness and, and you know, gross negativity that we had before. But, in, but, but um, for other values, First of all, we never, have any, we never have any arrows that move upwards or downwards in this chain because you're always fixed at a given value of alpha bar, so your risk preference remains constant. And as I advertised, you're also more, um, you're also more risk averse in this case. The net amount of risk aversion is greater. So therefore, for instance, the values of these states here at this 0.05 uh, 
of value of risk, so quite you know, significant risk aversion, you can see that these states are quite negative here, whereas in this, um, in this uh, with PC bar, they're relatively positive. And then you can see here's the full collection of um, values. And you can see this excess negativity that you have for NC bar because of this sequential problem, because, you're, as you know, because risk is compounding as you go through this sequence. And that's sort of one reason why this is a thing. It's interesting to think about these sequential problems as different from sort of the one-shot prospect theory style problems that we're familiar with from the from, from economics, for instance. Um, for the uh, optimal uh, for the optimal policy, remember this was the PC bar optimal policy starting at alpha equals 0.3. And then the um, the NC bar optimal policy, again, it's not tied between the different levels, so there's nothing that can happen. You can see that you do you can do a little bit better than than you could than you could with a, just a random walk, but you still have this property that you're more risk averse and that your the net amount of risk aversion is greater with NC bar than it is with um, than it is with a PC bar in this instance. Um, and for this cliff, again, at the lowest, uh, at the most risk averse level, we had this um, case that, that in the PC bar, you just sort of went up one and then just to try to avoid the, um, the lava cliff. Um, and then if you do it in the NC bar case, we now have this really dramatic risk aversion where you just go oh, straight up. And in fact, at the top, you don't, you're trying to go left. You're not even trying to, you're not even risking trying to go across the, uh, across the, across the cliff at all. Um, okay. So. What I've shown you is this sort of parametric risk avoidant behavior. And so we've seen it in two different ways. There's this pre-committed way, this PC bar, which has this justified gambler's fantasy. So risk um, processing in this case is a bit more complicated because you have this extra dimension. Um, and in fact, this induction of an extra dimension is familiar in other risk um, processing methods too. Like if you have mean variance con control, you have to have another dimension as well. because you have to work out both you know, something like the sum of rewards and the sum of the squared re returns you have. In order to work out the, the the true mean and variance on on whole parts, but PC bar has the has the uh, benefit of being co a coherent risk measure. And then from nested C bar, we have this ex excessive risk aversion. Um, and of course, you still need to have different values alpha if you want to change your risk aversion level. But if you're you know, you're you have a particular risk aversion alpha bar, you're going to stick with that the whole time, and then everything's and then everything is fine. From a psychiatric perspective, you think a bit about sort of, the, in some sense, the wrong problem. That's the case where you know what makes you pathologically avoid um, different sorts of behavior. Um, so one thing is that your the, the risk preference that you have could be very uh, out, you know, could be very extreme compared to other people in the population, for instance. And that means you just don't want to take any risk. If you think you no, know, we you know, the world is complicated. There always are some some chance that something nasty could happen. So if you have a very low risk preference, like uh, like alpha is near to zero then you're, the way that you're evaluating these outcomes becomes, of course, um, quite bad. And then if you have an NC bar mechanism, so you're, you have this nested process, that can make it even worse. And so maybe they, the people could, could have, uh, we're actually interested in thinking about sort of interpolations between the sort of NC bar and PC bar mechanism itself. And then furthermore, in stochastic problems, if alpha equals zero, um, that means that you really are only thinking about the worst case, then, the, then they're essentially you're completely indifferent to what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. So you have a sort of helplessness gets built in. And indeed, you know, one of the, you know, we know there's a lot of comorbidity, for instance, between depression and anxiety. And we can think of one of the things which is making the world look very uh, uh, like an unhappy place is because of the, the way that you're evaluated with this risk preference um, through this sort of helplessness that gets induced. You, you do have control over the world, but because you believe that the worst thing will happen, you essentially believe yourself that you don't actually have any control. And that's the distortion that happens in the risk measure that, that, that I mentioned. Um, let me, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip this and tell you about a two-step task. I won't. Okay, so that's um, how we think about the online control. So here, what we're doing there is thinking about the, the choices we make and how you might avoid aspects of the, um, uh, aspects of the environment. You might plot bad paths around, or maybe you just don't move out of your chair at all. So now what we'd like to think about is planning that you might do on the way towards generating a good quality policy. So online, you know, we might imagine something like, for instance, some sort of model-based reinforcement learning, like Monte Carlo tree search, you know, would be a sort of popular way of thinking about doing things. But also there's a lot of work these days thinking about offline planning that you can do during periods of quiet wakefulness or sleep, for instance, where you can then essentially have the opportunity to take what you know about the domain and generate a good quality policy for that domain. And so in this instance, we think of using something like, say, coordinated hippocampal or cortical replay to do 
to something like invert the model you have of the world, where the inversion in a, in a market decision process is essentially generating a good quality policy. And there's lots of evidence, in, you know, for the more than 20 years worth of uh, evidence in rodents about these sort of replay processes. It's been tied to behavior in some lovely work, Lauren Frank and other, uh, Dave Reddish and, other, and others too. And there's more recent work in humans where also we've been seeing these aspects of replay using MEG or using um, fMRI, and then looking at and then thinking about what effect that might have on behavior. So maybe there are these offline mechanisms where we think about the world and do some planning in that context. So in reinforcement learning, this is really a, a really venerable idea from Rich Sutton called Dyna in the uh, early 90s, where he had the idea that we had this model, and then with a model you could plan um, virtual trajectories. Um, in order to essentially engage the post process of exploration. So you have a model, you train a model free policy that then knows how to plan in the world to get to see a place that you haven't been for a long time, for instance, to see if it's any good. And then there was a lovely paper a few years ago by um, Matter and uh, Dorr, where they essentially uh, argued that this replay process that we see in rodents and humans might be doing um, a form of this uh, optimized pl offline planning. Um, and they, uh, and they then argued what order of, of, of replays should you do given your goal of building the best sort of offline plan. And so they showed that you, the, the way that you should choose states in the world to do this replay should be a product of two factors, a gain factor, which is says how much um, you, when you get to, if you were to think about a state in the world that's not where you currently are, how much would your policy change? What would the benefit be of the policy change you do as a state? And then a need factor would be how frequently you visit that state in the future. So how important is, it, is, it, is that state to you if you're changing your policy? Um, and so we're going to follow them, uh, follow along with them. And just imagine that we can work out what the optimum place to do this, uh, this replay are. But instead of using an average case reward, which is what, what um, uh, uh, Matter and Dor did, we're going to think about choosing optimal replays, optimal offline planning in order to, uh, to have the, the best risk sensitive policy that you might have. So we're choosing the state to do the replay at according to what makes the most difference in the risk sensitive value at the state, at the start state or wherever you happen to be at the moment. So we're thinking at other, we're doing distal replay places in the future. So what does that look like then in, if you have a PC bar um, value function? So you're thinking about this pre-committed C bar in the future. You think, okay, but if I start off that all I know that all I know about is this the the I have a model of the world, but I don't have any values in it except for the value of the lava pit and the value of these two of these rewards. The reward is two here, the reward is one here. And so if I if my value of alpha equals to one, so I, that's why I, I, and I start state here. What these numbers show is what's the sequence of replay events that I do in order to try and build the best, you know, to, in order to have essentially the best possible. Um, effect on my value at the start state. And so here you can see that you start off um, one step um, you know, where the big reward is, also one step away from the lava pit. The second one is then uh, next to that. So you work out um, how to go get from, from here to here, then the third step and the fourth step. So for those of you who know it, this looks very much like prioritized sweeping, an algorithm from An Andrew Moore in the, um, in the, uh, also in the 90s. And then in the end, you also, you know, by the time you get to the sixth replay, you say, okay, well, if I were that reward, then I should do the reward of one, I should stick there. And so you just get this sequence. So what happens as we make um, alpha um, lower? So now we're more risk, um, we're now more risk averse. So now remember we have these two dimensions. We have the for PC bar, we have to worry about what planning looks like, not only um, as a function of states, the physical state in the world, but also alpha states, so, so how risk averse we are. And so now from this start state, you can see that the first replay you do, even though we're interested in the 0.3 um, uh, risk preference, it turns out the first replay you do is at the 0.6 risk preference. Because remember, if you were to be unlucky and move in the, in the direction of the lava pit, then your risk preference goes up. You get, you get, you get to be more risk seeking because you, you've already absorbed some of your bad luck. This is the gambler's fantasy. So you have basically a bunch of planning to do right next to the, to the lava pit. And only then do you start to, to, you know, to, to spread out in other locations. And so you can see that this, of course, we have a much more complicated problem. And you spend a lot of your time thinking about this lava pit at these, in this instance, at these different risk preference levels. And um, uh, if you remember, this is what the optimal policy that you would look like at this alpha equals 0.3. So it's going to take you a long time to get there, obviously. You have to do a lot of these replays. And as you become more risk averse, so now if there's 0.05, 
you're essentially spending more and more of your time worrying about how to avoid getting into the lava pit. So here you can see that, um, so in this case, the fifth and sixth replay events that you, optimal replay events that you do are actually, at the, are actually working out what to do at this high um, degree of risk aversion to try and avoid getting into the, try to avoid getting into the, um, the lava pit. Um, if we look at this in the case of NCVAR, so the nested CVAR, which is, remember, much more risk averse, but now we can now look at this completely separately for each value of alpha, because each value of alpha has an independent, um, is an independent construct. And you can see that, um, so now if your alpha is one, it looks just the same as before. Here I've shown you just the first five replay events. And then as you get more and more risk averse, um, then you spend all your time working out how to avoid the lava pit. If you then, um, and as you become a little bit less risk averse, you can see that you split up some of your time thinking, well, how do I avoid, um, the, how do I, if I actually were at R equals two, I'm going to try and stay there. But if I'm more risk averse, I, I work out how to move away from it. So you get this nice pattern of risk aversion. And you can see that your replays are now a bit like a bit ruminative. You're constantly, in some sense, you're ruminating about these nasty things that can happen because you're trying to uh, generate a plan for yourself of things to avoid. Another example of that is here's a simpler maze where you have a start state here, and there's just a lava pit at this location and a, a single reward at this location here. And if we prioritize based on the, if we work out the replay priority based on um, risk neutrality, so alpha equals one, at this start state, you, you spend all your time working out how to get to the reward. But if we now make it more risk averse, you're worried about the bad things that can happen. Now you spend all this rumination worrying about how to avoid the lava pit. You don't spend any of these first ruminations working out how to get to the reward, even though the dynamics of the world are exactly the same. So it's your personal preference, which has then had this big effect on changing the way that you, you, you change the access or the, uh, uh, that you have to this world. OK, so let me, um, uh, let me sum up. So from this computational psychiatry point of view, so the wrong problem says that we have this, we have this optimally, so correctly, we have this sort of dysfunctional avoidance and rumination. And that comes if you have a low value of alpha and if you use NC bar, so you use this, um, this nested C bar, which has this um, cumulative effect where life gets worse and worse as, you, as, you, as time goes by. For alpha equals um, near to zero, then um, you have this sort of action indifference and you, because it doesn't matter what you do, nasty things are going to happen anyway. You get this sort of helplessness gets built up where, um, where you know, uh, you're just always thinking, well, the worst possible outcome could happen. So it's not worth your while risk anything. Um, we can imagine that when, for instance, um, when we're doing planning, this offline planning, there'd be some sort of threshold for improvement. So you, so you can imagine that when you're, um, you know, how, how long should you spend doing this rumination, how much control, how much sort of meta control you should have in controlling this process of rumination is something where, again, people might differ in their, their degree of, of, um, of, of uh, improvement they want. Um, and so again, this could be a sort of, a, a sort of wrong problem mechanism. Um, and then, as I mentioned, one of the things about the, uh, our, uh, our environment is that there are often many different things that could have happened in, uh, instead, that could have happened differently. So, as I said, with, you know, like the, from the perspective, you know, if you got run over, you know, if you hadn't been, the car hadn't been there, if you'd waited the traffic lights and so forth. And so one thing that I think it would be interesting to do is to think about sort of non-parametric um, sort of infinite models, like these non-parametric Bayesian models, which could, have, in some sense, parameterize that there's always another catastrophe around the, around the bend. And so that would then allow us to think as you get more risk averse in that sort of domain, then, then uh, you'll see an even more dramatic effect because there are just so many ways that nasty things could happen. Um, and then something we're working on at the moment is to think about risk sensitivity in the exploration exploitation trade-off, right? So if you, don't, if, you, if you come not knowing the dynamics of a problem, so you, here you have to learn about how an environment works, then now, if you're doing your um, you're doing your ex your exploration, like the uh, actually, well, the, actually Sean has done some lovely work on this uh, himself. Then, but now if you think about that in a risk in a risk averse manner, now you're very worried because you don't know what the structure of the of the, of the nasty things could be. And of course, you you have a you know this ambiguity you have this second order uncertainty means that you're then if you're then highly risk averse, you're going to be very reluctant to go and do any exploration at all because the dangers are, are always looming. Then what happens? Um, so another way that people think about risk, risk sensitivity is a sort of robustness to misspecification. So here, there's a, like a total amount of, of, of disturbance between the true probabilities of the world and, the, and, the, um, and what you believe them to be, or maybe a misspecification of the model of the world. 
And so I think it's interesting to think about what that looks like in this case. And people have used risk, me risk measures to think about the consequence of this misspecification itself. So the wrong solution, these are cases where you're trying to solve the, the correct problem, but you don't have the right way, you don't have the right mechanisms for doing it. And here, this relates, I think, to something which, um, which uh, Quentin Hughes and I worked on a while ago, where we were thinking about the, um, the issues about updating. So here, in this replay, this offline planning process, you have to be thinking about these nasty states. You have to be thinking about the lava pit uh, 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 in, order to, in order to work out what to do. And so one characteristic that we that, that is, has been well known for, for many years is that there's a sort of Pavlovian avoidance. You know, you don't like to think about nasty things. You don't like to do actions, which, you know, positive actions that lead you into, 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 in, in, the face of, um, in the face of possible punishment. So when we've argued that this uh, neuromodulated serotonin might be involved in this process, in fact, we argued it about chains of thought, thinking about, actually about worry and rumination. So one thing you might imagine is that you try to in induce one of these chains of thought and you fail. So you don't actually do the update that you need that in order to work out the planning that you should do to avoid that lava pit. And that means that then you have to think about it again and again and again. So you never really update the model of the world satisfactorily to realize that you can actually work out a policy that would avoid it. We can imagine also that you're committed to a PC bar, this pre-committed C bar mechanism. But if you don't um, adjust your um, if you don't adjust your alpha appropriately for where bad things have, because bad things have happened, that means that then you, as much as you should do, that means you're going to end up with more apparent risk aversion than is your actual risk averse setting. So you know, if you have some degree of risk aversion, something nasty happens, you have to think that then I can allow to increase my value of alpha, to become more risk, um, risk see a little bit more risk seeking. If you don't do that, so then essentially you see this sort of continuity on the way towards NC bar. Although I don't think that that, that continuity process would lead to a um, would lead to a coherent risk measure, something we're thinking about uh, as well. Um, in terms of the wrong environment, that's a case where you're trying to solve the problem correctly, but you know, the, the environment is, uh, is unfortunate. Then, of course, one aspect of that is, could just be that you're, you know, you've learned about the, the statistics of risk in, the, in a bad environment. But another is, and this is something which you also see in the context of depression, is that the, the, the way that you represent the world, you could have a sort of overgeneralization, which means that you know, the possibility that, you know, there's a, that, that you're, you're taking two states where one of them has a bit of risk associated with it, some possible nasty outcome, another state has no risk at all. If you overgeneralize those so that you put those states together and you have a severe risk aversion, for instance, alpha is near to zero, then essentially the little bit of risk associated with the state that you've overgeneralized will completely corrupt the value of this perhaps much larger state you know, that, is, that is actually much more benign. So your risk aversion um, can have this, uh, the way that you represent the world, so the, the, which is something which, again, you come up with through the process of, an, of an engagement with an environment to make life uh, nasty for you. So I think that there are lots of links between these computational psychiat psychiatric notions and this risk aversion. And I think that thinking about it in this sequential context gives a much richer picture than you can see with the things like the prospects theory, the single choice and mechanisms we had before. So thank you very much indeed. So let me stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I'm not sure if Sham is still uh, around. Um, uh, Sham, maybe Sham can guide the questions. I didn't know if he's still around. I think he had something to take over. Uh, yeah, I can uh, guide the questions. So thank you. Uh, questions. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I can ask a question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'm very, I'm very interested in this uh, trade-off between uh, exploration and exploitation. And uh, I was wondering uh, what, if you have any metrics where you compare probability distributions of what you're building online with what experiences you may have from offline. Uh, I mean, there's this experience replay that people do in reinforcement learning, and there's different things that people are looking there. I was wondering, how do you, how do you compare the probability distributions or if you care about that? Yeah. Yes, we, we definitely do care about it. So we've, what we've generally thought about is, is sort of the, the, the base adapt to start off with is the base adaptive setting. That's where you have a model of the world, you know that you, what you don't know about it. And as you get experience, you feed that experience into your, into your, into your, into your Bayesian model of the world. But um, what you then need to do is to use that information to do, to do um, appropriate planning in this, this risk of setting. 
So the so the offline replay is a way of taking the data you, you've collected online and then being more efficient in using it, right? You say, okay, well, I want to you know, use that as my notion of the world. My model of the world is just an experiential model of the world. I'm going to use that to generate an, a policy by a sort of model inversion. That's exactly what we imagine replay might be, although in my, you know, for the, in the, in the, um, so in the diner case, what you do is you use your model of the world. You say, I'm going to, Places that I haven't been in the past, I'm going to give them essentially an exploration bonus. I'm going to imagine that uh, it's worth my while to visit those states because I haven't been there for a while. Things might have changed. And then you use this offline mechanism to plan to get to those states. We're trying to do exactly the same, but in this risks, in this risk, um, in this risk averse manner. Then you have this trouble that um, that that now the way that um, when you have so sort of partial observability, now you have a belief state MDP rather than a, rather than a regular MDP. And now generalization has is very important. So when you get a little piece of experience, you find something out about the world, you have to then generalize it appropriately to all the things that you would have discovered. So I, you take some step in the world, you then sort of change the way that you, uh, the, the changes the, um, the way that you imagine all the states that, all the belief states associated with the real state that you could, could have got in gets changed. And so the, the process is much more complicated, but essentially it's, it, it uses these, this, this offline mechanism. And I think that this idea about replay that you can see it is it's it's a very general idea. So, for instance, uh, people in in the um, in in the uh, sensory processing community, you want to build an offline. You have an online model where you learn about things in the world. You under offline, you want to learn how to recognize those things in the world appropriately. So, in your generative model for planning, you do it. You do as we argued. You can do it for, for risk sensitivity or not risk sensitivity to do this do this um, work out the optimal uh, optimal actions. For, um, for memory, the notion of consolidation or semanticization, you have an episodic experience and you want to then say, well, now I want to have access to that experience in the appropriate way. And again, you, that's this offline mechanism. So this replay is very, very general, with lots of different problems. It's very, it's very, very important. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I've got a, a question. Uh, so you mentioned, especially in closing, that this is kind of a, um, sequential counterpart to prospect theory or other kinds of risk sensitive things. But um, of course, distribution RL provides another kind of way of attacking a sequential problem. I know that you've done uh, work on this with like Pablo Tano and, and Alex Bouget. And I'm just wondering if you can clarify the um, distinctions here, because at least as I understand it, it seems like you could get all of these CVAR um, statistics basically from first learning a, a distribution and then applying some simple computation to it. So is there uh, a, an advantage to learning CVAR directly versus as like the subsidiary? Yeah, so the, so so it, it, we actually uh, have done a little bit of work thinking about, we have a third sort of CVAR called fixed CVAR, which is actually the way that you would do it with distributional, um, with distributional RLs, where you build up these distributions. So the fixed CVAR, if you do it sort of the Dabney way, turns out not to be time consistent. Um, there's a, it's, 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 it's basically, it, it's, it is something which is a little bit between the PC bar. So it's like, it's PC bar like in the, that you think about the whole distribution, but, it, but it's NC bar like in that you keep a, the way that they've done it is you keep a fixed value of alpha as you go down these different levels. But it turns out that um, that combination is not, uh, is, is not time consistent. And there's a simple problem, a simple, um, uh, like a little tree, you can show uh, what happens when you try to do that. So you're right that we should. Know that there's a lot of interesting work these days in, in distributional RLs. Of this lovely work from from uh, Nao Yoshida and um, and Will Dabney and the, the, the DeepMind Mark Bellamere and so forth. Um, and um, but but the argument that they have generally used for thinking about that has been has often been about how do you get, get, get generate good representations that you can use at the alpha equals one level, right? That was the sort of the doing their paper. That's the, the argument they're making. And although there is a little bit of work using that for doing um, for doing risk sensitive planning. As I say, it won't work exactly like that because that's not time consistent. And then you will, then it's like time inconsistency and discounting, temporal discounting, where again you run into problems where you 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 need a commit pre-commitment device. And so in PC bar, you have that pre-commitment device in that you could commit this alpha, and then you need a mechanism to enforce that pre-commitment as you go. In NC bar, you don't need to do that. And in the fixed C bar, so that's the distributional version, it doesn't quite work. So I'll um... Uh, jump in with one. It's a bit of a broader question, but just how you think about um, dealing with um, these models in high dimensions, uh, this, this kind of representational learning question, because, uh, you know, this level of abstraction, you have a model, but somehow it's tractable because, you you know, it's like it's the right abstraction. And how do you think about this link? Uh, um, 
So I think that's really, really hard. As, as I was arguing right at the end, that's really hard if you have this risk sensitivity, because of course, as you get more risk sensitive, you start to bleed, you know, nasty things get to bleed into these, into these, nice, these nice aspects. Right. And so um, I think that you're going to, I think you know, we haven't thought of a good way around that. I don't know how you can avoid that becoming a real problem of, uh, for you in, 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 in high dimensional problems. And so, um, uh, and then the planning becomes nasty in those, in those cases too. So I think that maybe you're just you're, you're, you're going to have to, um, you, know, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that the, you're committed to the idea that not things can happen. Well, not things can happen. They're, they're just part of that safe space. You've got any ideas? <laughs> We'd be welcome. I mean, I, yeah, no, I've been thinking about this for a while. And um, um, I mean, there is a growing body of work. I think we're understanding what types of representations, what, uh, what they need to satisfy when they aren't capturing somehow um, all of the details about the world. Uh, but um, yeah, the questions of how we learn such features, uh, they still are essentially positing there's a, a kind of a low rank structure in the world and um, that still feels somehow um, unsatisfying in, in many problems. And what you need is um, a bit like so some of the H infinity like notions where you say, okay, here's the here's the you know we have some very strong bounds on on uh, on the bad things that can happen outside a domain, right? You say you say imagine I have a really good model of the really bad things that can happen, and then I have you know, then everything all the other nasty things that can happen they're limited in some in some way. So you need to have sort of like a variable threshold, and then you'll say, okay, well now I know I need to spend a lot of my effort working out exactly how not to how to avoid the catastrophes. But then all the all the, the moderate nasty things will get lumped into a little bit, and then and then maybe that will that, that's a sort of domain, a sort of a, um, a benign domain that you can then do some of this planning in that perhaps will work. Um, are there any other questions? I'm gonna have like uh, uh, many other questions I could go on. Maybe I'll ask one more and then we'll thank Peter again. So uh, on this point, do you think of a role of like policy-based learning uh, as well? I mean, like in other, so say motor control or something, it, does, it feels like at some point you just kind of memorize certain policies and you know maybe you don't have a model of the world uh, for, for how you behave there or are you largely yes. in this model-based? Well, so I think, so I, we try, I think the replay is a very nice interaction between those two. And in fact, the way we're thinking about this, so one context we're thinking about it quite a lot actually is this defensive hierarchy. You know, there's this notion about defensive distance. So as you, you know, go from, uh, you know, before you see a predator, before, a predator you, before you see a predator, after you see the predator, but it hasn't seen you, after you know, it's seen you and so forth. So um, what you should do at the higher levels of this hierarchy when defensive distance is big, you still have time, is to use you know, everything you can see to build a, a policy um, that then you can then use Quickly, you don't have to think about it. So you basically you, you monitor. Okay, well, I know if you know, if the threat happens, I can know exactly how I run away. I don't have to sit there and think over well, what should I do in this context. And so I think there, that's a really nice sort of context where you could use this risk sensitivity to build a better plan that then will allow you to get to sorry, a better policy would allow you to do something. And so then that's a sort of nice interaction between these two. And I think that's one reason why these this sort of matter and door like structure is a very nice way of thinking about this sort of this replay process as it, as it goes. So lots of interesting things there. Okay, great. Um, shall we thank Peter again? Um, all right. Thanks again, Peter, for a wonderful talk. And it was great to see you. Uh, Thanks very much indeed. Thanks again. I really enjoyed the chance to see you. Hope to come see you in Harvard sometime. Yeah, I'll, I'll come out to uh, Germany. Right. Thanks. Uh, Bye. Bye. Bye.